Start streaming. Uh, I think that's gonna work. <laughs> uh, it's been a while since I did a stream. I've been so busy with my kids. All four kids were in Odyssey of the Mind competitions and that just ended this weekend. So a ton of work, so proud of those guys. And now I'm back at it. And I was doing a job today that I typically don't do. It was this uh, Apple Watch. So Apple Watches, we generally don't, don't offer solutions for, but this was for our new business to business repair program for uh, folks that are running cell phone repair shops that wanna outsource all their board repair. So we recently started a B2B wholesale program. So if you want in on that, you can head over to ipadrehab.com and get yourself set up. Let me show you how to do that. Uh, let's see, yep. Go to ipadrehab.com and you can click on our blog. So our blog has an article that tells you all about our B2B program. And all you have to do to get the price list is just send us an email. There's a little contact form there and we'll shoot you over and get you signed up with a B2B number. Um, while we're here, don't forget to come out to Masterclass. Masterclass is uh, this May 17th through the 24th. You can read all about it here on our blog as well. So check those things out if you haven't already. We're excited about both of those new initiatives. Um, so today I was working on this uh, Apple Watch that had a battery connector that just kind of got pulled up. So that connector just ripped off the board. So um, it was sent here with a companion. She sent two. Uh, one is the donor board and one was the real board. And you can see it right here. And so I, I uh, did a video that I want to send. I'm trying out a new video editor. So we're going to see if they can make a quick video on that repair. But while I was doing it, I was thinking about all of these different types of solder paste that are out there. So on that job, I had to decide what type of solder paste to use to harvest a connector out of something like this and make it suitable to transfer in to something like this that in a way that would make it really robust because you have to be able to press into the connector and pull it back out without doing exactly what happened to this, which is ripping the whole connector off. So how do all these different solder paste come into play? So I thought, you know, this is a good thing to talk about because there's a lot of these bismuth solders that we haven't been using for a while that are starting to crop up. So let's talk about this stuff. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Yes, it's a iPad rehab. We're going to do a little bit of chemistry, maybe. All right. So let's, um, let's go, let's find a browser. So let's enable this. And, uh, first of all, I want to introduce you guys to the green one. So the green one, green solder, we are going to call this the 172. So the 172 is the solder that we have recently started to sell at iPad Rehab Supply as our mid temperature solder paste recommendation. So you can pick up this green solder paste. So this is what we use for your mid range applications like iPhone 10 reballing in the middle layer and CPU rework. So this is 172. This is the, the, the mid, mid temp stuff. So I, you know, and this is a bismuth solder. So that's why I want to do this stream so that we can kind of talk about that. So, um, and it's confusing because these things are labeled lead free, which they don't have lead in them. They are lead free. But when we think of lead free, we think of the high 217 degrees Celsius stuff. So lead free. Now we got to kind of expand our definition to include these business solders. So let's go to a browser and let's, uh, let's first talk about where you can find this stuff. So you can go to the supply store and at iPad Rehab Supply, you can see a lot of confusing stuff that, I, that I'm trying to, to make it clear, but here's our, uh, here's our mid temp um, 172 green, green stuff. So that's what we're recommending. And I've seen a bunch of people asking about what do we use for this stuff. Also, here's my other recent ads. These are my favorite tweezers. Here they are. 
ding, ding. These are what, this is my pick for BGA rework. So out with the green Dumonts, these are my new pick. They're more durable and I really like them. They're very ultra fine, but stronger than the previous pick, which was the green one. And then the quick, the quick is finally in house. So if you've been waiting around to get your chance of the quick, we have finally filed enough PayPal claims against the quick people that they finally produced our order and it actually got here. So these are in house. So, uh, check out iPad rehab supply. Now let's go over to, uh, let's go over to this. All right. So this is something that I talk about at, uh, practical board repair school day one, that it's important to know what's up with these different types of solder. So let's call attention to a couple of different ones that are on this chart. So Kester, our guys have been making solder for a really long time. What brand are those tweezers? They are, I don't know what brand. They are iPad rehab brand. Um, Swiss Inox something, I forget. All right, so this is this 6337. So the 6337, that's one to remember. And it translates here to the one that we call 183 solder. This is traditional eutectic meaning it has that flash point of it melts at one specific temperature 183 this is traditional robust the good stuff leaded solder and the ratio of tin to lead is 63 37 and if you change that you can really see on this chart what if you mix 60 40 lead to tin that that really changes those melting temperatures what if you make it 50 50 you know, it really, really changes. So that 6337 is sort of golden ratio for tin and lead that make it melt at 183 degrees. So this is the stuff that we use when we reball audio IC. This is traditional leaded solder. Now this stuff used to be used all over the place and it's now no longer used in iPhones and traditional consumer electronics. But I'll tell you where it is used. This stuff is what's used on the space shuttle. This stuff is what's used on military grade electronics. This is the good stuff because it's robust and strong. It doesn't fall, fall apart. It's malleable and it makes really good joints. So unfortunately, lead isn't something that you want to lick. It's a neurotoxin. So you don't want to consume it. And therefore there was a, an initiative across the whole world in the early 2000s to let's just try to get away from using leaded solder. So this stuff is what we use for repair because that's our impact on the environment. So we'll kind of put that down. So then the world decided, well, what can we use for lead free applications to get rid of lead? And they went through a lot of uh, debate, you know, all of these big academic institutions and you can read tons and tons and tons of papers. And some of the candidates that they thought about trying were these ones here, the bismuth solder, the bismuth solders. And those were voted down. Those were not the pick. They were not chosen to be the, the, the new solder. Those were voted out. And what was voted in, the stuff that's voted in is this stuff here. So the stuff that's in the iPhone, that's in all your consumer electronics for the most part is SAC, this, uh, this uh, tin, silver copper conglomerate. Now that stuff is really good. Not as good as the leaded stuff, a little bit more brittle. And the big drag is that you got to get it seriously hot. Maybe it's this one, S A C. So you've got to get it seriously hot, like 217 degrees melting temperature, which means you need to be working up at, you know, 280 degrees in order to get the stuff to, to melt. That's really, really hot. So um, then I, I wanted to call your attention to those guys as well. All right, um, just checking in on, on some chat. All right, now let's talk about, click over here, let's talk about the low temperature solders. So there's this category of the bismuth solder. So here we have our, you know, here's our good old 6337, our 183. And then down here in green, we have this one here, which is tin 42 and a big healthy chunk of something else called bismuth. So bismuth 58%. So this mixture of tin and bismuth doesn't have any lead in it, 
uh, that has a really low melting temperature. So it has a really low melting temperature. So that's the 138. And we've got some of that right here. 138 is a low melt solder paste that you, that you can use but it has some drawbacks. And so you kind of have to, to be careful. So the green one, the 172, and this one, the, the you know, 4258 is the 138 degree solder. I think it's probably easiest for us all to just call it by the melting temperature. So 172 and 138. These things are, are fairly equivalent. They're both bismuth solders. Um, you know, it seems like this one, this one has a, a slightly, you know, it's sort of a mid temperature. This is a low temperature. All right. So what's the downside? Why not use these? How come these things got voted down? What's up with that? And this is what you need to be aware of because we are starting to use these for our really sensitive applications. And here's the thing. So I want you to read this little highlighted part. Hopefully it's highlighted for you guys. Is it? Yes. All right. So caution must be used when using a tin bismuth alloy. It is dangerous to mix tin bismuth with lead containing alloys. So what does that mean? This stuff cannot mix with this stuff. Leaded solder. <laughs> Do not mix these together. Well, it's really hard to not mix them together because this stuff is all over your tips. It's all over everything. It's everywhere. You're using it all the time. Every audio I see that you've reballed with this stuff, it's on your stencils, it's on your tweezers, it's on your Q-tips, it's everywhere. Don't mix it with this stuff. Why not? Because it gets you into trouble. So let's, let's read why. So tin, bismuth, and lead, if you mix them together, if you get lead into the picture, then it can form a new alloy. And that new alloy is an extremely low, dangerously low melting combination that melts around 95, 96 degrees Celsius. That's way too low to actually use. So this could potentially lead to solder joint failure due to the natural heating of the assembly during use. And that makes a lot of sense, right? If you have something at 95 degrees Celsius that's going to turn liquid, that's really not something that you could leave by accident inside your car and shut the windows up in the summer, you know, that's, that's really not cool, right? So uh, let's look at this other article. You know, so I've been just kind of researching this stuff around as we have started listing this for sale because I don't want anybody to get into trouble. So I just want everyone to be aware. So I like this article as well. And, uh, and, and there was a lot of debate on this stuff because these were a contender. This was gonna be what your iPhone was made out of, except for, this uh, sort of you know, profile where it can have a fairly dangerous instability if there's lead around. So uh, here's another highlighted one here, which is when the industry was preparing to tr transition to lead-free solders almost 10 years ago, uh, <laughs> 20 years ago, that's a long time, uh, the, the tin business were serious candidates. The 138 especially made them interesting candidates to replace leaded solder. However, if contaminated with lead, tin business solders can produce a eutectic phase that melts at 96 degrees Celsius. In such situations, the resulting solder joint exhibits pro poor performance in thermal cycle testing. So these guys have said, and it's been tested to say, well, can you get away with it? And the answer is not long-term. It doesn't have a long-term reliability. And then one last thing saying the same thing, which is a more, you know, a, a longer uh, article. Now this article is trying to make the point of, yeah, but nobody has lead around anymore. We got rid of lead back in 2003. So there isn't any lead solder anymore, except for those iPhone people. So nobody has lead. So why don't we go back and consider the business again? Because it can't mix with lead. There isn't any lead. Well, here's some lead. <laughs> you know, there's lead everywhere around the iPhone labs. Um, so these guys are saying the reason why they, they kind of decided against it is because when these solders were used on parts that had lead plated leads. So think about your reballed chip, that's lead balls. Then this special eutectic alloy could form that's a mixture 
of the bismuth tin plus the lead. And the low melting point of that alloy could cause the solder joints to weaken at high operating temperatures, resulting in field failures. Right? So, so these all kind of come together to make one picture. And that picture is that you have to be really, really care. Whoa, <laughs> I didn't re realize the green screen was making it so like Homer Simpson radioactive. Yes, if you mix lead, it will turn radioactive and you'll get cancer and die. All right, so that's, that part's not true. But you have, to be, you have to be careful with these bismuth alloys. And you know, you, especially if your application is for long-term use. So uh, it's fun to think about, well, what happens if you intentionally mix together? Uh, it's really crazy. <laughs> what happens if you intentionally, let's get rid of this, uh, mix together, here we go. What if you intentionally mix together the bismuth guys, these guys, with, with leaded? Then you would actually create on purpose the like ultra uber duber low melt solder and that's what this is so this this chip quick is a is sort of a proprietary mixture that is essentially going to be uh this stuff mixed together to create that ultra low uh 96 degrees and then some other things that are making that even even lower so chip quick is advertised that chip quick you know data sheet to melt at 83 degrees Celsius. So this, we can kind of look and see that this stuff here would be what we would be soldering with if we allowed that mixing to happen. And that's kind of a big deal because if you, if you look at, this is a strip of chip quick and this is uh, you know, right over here, just a regular piece of leaded solder. You can, you can really kind of imagine what would happen if you made joints out of that stuff. Let's just look at the kind of overall pliability. This is our regular leaded solder. And this is our uh, chip quick. So let's just bend the chip quick and it just breaks. It's extremely brittle. Yeah, so this stuff is just, you know, just super, super, super duper brittle. So that makes it tough. If you think about a chip that was actually reballed with something like that, then it's easy to see that it would, it would have a really high failure rate or it would be likely to have a really high failure rate. Now, is that a big deal if you're talking about an iPhone 10 uh, middle board reball? Uh, you know, a lot of that is just grounds. So you could maybe get away with it, you know, so you, you know, you could, you're really only kind of concerned about those sort of interior joints. Uh, but how does that thing get to need a reball to begin with? It's because it bends. So if you have any kind of bend, if you're bend, if your joints are made out of this stuff, you know, bend is not going to last very long. So don't bend your iPhone 10 if somebody's been working on it that might have mixed or used this alloy. And, uh, and, I've, and I've learned recently that there are folks that are out there that are intentionally doing this. They're intentionally mixing these things, intentionally creating the uber ultra dangerous low melt solder paste and using that on purpose to do, you know, CPU rework and reballing. That's really, uh, really dangerous for long term use uh, because uh, it's just going to be, <laughs> it's going to melt if you leave it in your car and if you drop it on the ground, it's going to, it's going to quit working. Um, if it's for data recovery, then go ahead because it's very, very, very easy to work with stuff that melts if you just kind of like, you know, kind of breathe on it a little bit. All right. Um, so I did a little, uh, I did a, a, a little example over here. So this is a couple of uh, NANs that I have sitting here on a traditional hot plate. And just for, for the fun of it, I, I reballed uh, one of them with regular old 183, the regular old stuff you reball with every day, leaded 6337. And then on the other one, I mixed that with the, you know, the business solder. So I just kind of like mixed it together and, and I did this other chip. So let's kind of look at that, what that looks like under the microscope. And this is just kind of sitting on a hot plate and let's just see what do those look like. So let's grab 
Uh, <laughs> where's my thingy? Let's get rid of side cam. Here we go, microscope. All right, so now let's look under the microscope. Let's see if we can fix that up and see if we can figure out which one is which here. All right, so we've got, uh, we've got, we've got A and B. So this one, I can, I can poke, 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 poke. You know, nothing's, nothing's liquid there. And then over here, look at that. That stuff is, is liquid. And look at what happens when you, you know, when you poke it. Like you can, just sort of imagine how you know that's that's like such a disturbed bad looking you know ball if it just gets nudged if, if somebody just kind of like walks by when you're soldering that on you know that would be really really uh difficult to to work with and really likely to fail now our goal with master class and why are we talking about all the cpu stuff all of uh, you know all of the sudden is it's not because you're going to expect to see CPU work coming in your door every day, but you will see it. You know, you will see it. I've been asking around and talking to folks that have been doing this stuff for a long time, and uh, and and some guys have have clued me into the fact that some people out there are intentionally using this stuff. That's not good. As we're all starting to learn how to work with the CPU stuff. Uh, but some some guys have said, you know, hey, we've been doing it. We're big fans with it with the uh, iPhone 7 and up that uh, just kind of a general rule. If we if it takes, you know, longer than like 30 minutes to figure out what's wrong with the phone, then we we will just opt for CPU rework and we'll just do a board swap to an iCloud locked board, which is a great way to recycle in a, in a smart, intelligent way to recycle those iCloud locked boards um, by repairing uh, people's phones that have some sort of a difficult diagnosis or something that is uh, some kind of a fracture that you can't just fix. So that's a, that's a really good thing. But those are meant to be phones long term. And these folks are seeing a few cases a week. So I asked, like, what's the ratio of like your standard audio IC? So the shop that's seeing something like five audio ICs a day is seeing about three CPU cases a week. So that's a lot. That means it's kind of time to, to sit down and, and, and learn this stuff. So um, if you're going to be investing in CPU rework technology for repair to you know, fix people's phones, that may not make sense today, but it sure is going to make sense when the iPhone 10s are all getting, you know, flexion damage like the iPhone 7s are now because they're such an expensive phone. I think that water damage for the sake of repair is going to start making sense as well because it's such an expensive phone that, you know, now a $500 repair doesn't seem crazy. It seems like, well, if I can get my $1,000 phone to keep working for 500 bucks, then that sounds pretty good to me. So we're gonna really see the industry changing. That's why we're bringing over phone Kong experts to teach all of us the advanced diagnostics that, uh, that, that China has been working on with their dedicated research teams. We're so excited to uh, partner with phone Kong and to connect with those guys and, and uh, be able to ask those kinds of questions and learn some of the more advanced diagnostic content at the level of all of these data lines in these phones and to also learn uh, some technical proficiency uh, trades, uh, trade, I don't know, tips and techniques and things like that. So one of them is going to be to start using Bismuth Solder, but you have to be careful with it and you do not want to allow it to mix with your 183, don't you don't let these things mix. Or if you do, know that you have a setup then to create the Uber Ultra Low Melt, which is really not something that you want to be putting in a phone that you intend to be using long term, unless you live in you know an igloo or something where it's never going to get hot. Then maybe you'll be okay. Lewis and Justice streaming at the same time. All right. Well. Uh, Jessa is done with this stream. This was just sort of our introduction or little, uh, little uh, couple of tips on solder paste. And I might be back later. I have been working on a bunch of stuff and I 
been working on our website. So just a quick reminder, sign up for iPad Rehab business to business stuff. Read all about it, terms of service, all of this fine prints so that it, everything is, a, is totally straightforward. And then fill out the little contact form and get yourself signed up for the B2B price list. Um, and then also check out our master class. So we're super excited. We're getting some really great people from the community um, are starting to, to sign up. So it's gonna be an amazing event and we can't wait. Uh, the, I mean, these guys are really phenomenal. You know, they go around the world and teach people how to do CPU rework in uh, like the way, the methods that these guys have spent 15 years developing. And they've got, you know, all sorts of dudes that are or flipping the hard CPUs like A8 in two or three days, so that's pretty cool. But it's not a CPU rework class. It is all of this stuff. Um, haven't you ever wanted to use the rosin method for short detection <laughs> and uh, all of the, the you know, DC power troubleshooting of stuff that is uh, a little bit more advanced than your typical short detection? Uh, learn how to use your EEPROM programmer, uh, get out some oscilloscopes, uh, all of their uh, their sort of custom information, like they have worked out the in all of the nuts and bolts, which is a massive spider web of stuff to make face ID work. So that's going to be a big one with the iPhone 10, and a big one that they have recently added to this list, which is how to make the iPhone 10s Max a hardware fix to change it from a single SIM to a dual SIM, so that you can have two phone numbers in one phone. So that's a pretty cool upgrade that they're doing in China and they're gonna come teach us how to do it here as well. So head over and check us out, uh, iPad Rehab Training to get yourself signed up. And that's how you do it, just click right here and come and see us. That is it for right now. I might be back again later. I have two other things that I have to either stream or record. So hopefully you guys know a little bit more about solder paste than you did earlier today.